Okay, today we're going to talk about the underlying problem that is, at, that is at the heart of many of today's most prevalent health disorders. In this short presentation, we're going to introduce you to a class of chemicals called neurotransmitters and show you how improper neurotransmitter function can lead to a number of different health problems. We'll also talk about why medications often don't provide a lasting solution and show you how you can correct these imbalances so that you can get on with your life. My name is Chad Oler and I'm a naturopathic doctor. I've been working with neurotransmitter imbalances for about over 12 years and have helped thousands of people improve the quality of their lives by taking some simple steps to find and address the cause of their dysfunctions so that they can achieve lifelong solutions. First things first, neuro what? Uh, when I say the word neurotransmitter, a lot of people get uh, look just like these people on the screen here. But really, neurotransmitters are just a class of chemicals, or a class of chemical messengers, rather, in the body that help regulate, either directly or indirectly, most of the other body systems and functions. Most people have heard of several common neurotransmitters, including serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, which is also known as adrenaline. They may also be familiar with at least some of the functions in regard to mood, especially depression and anxiety, or ADD, ADHD. Usually this is because they know the standard medical treatment for these disorders is to use a medication that works on specific neurotransmitters, including selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are called SSRIs, selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, or norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitors. What most people don't know is that neurotransmitter imbalances can dramatically affect many other aspects of a person's health and can cause or exacerbate any of the following conditions. And you can see there's quite a few conditions on this page. Anything from depression and anxiety to hot flashes, sleep problems, poor memory, poor weight loss, fibromyalgia, ADD, ADHD, Parkinson's, addictions, eating disorders, and even Crohn's disease. Now, many, many people suffer from neurotransmitter imbalance but the symptoms they experience can be very different. In addition, many people often exhibit multiple signs of neurotransmitter imbalance, which means they have several of the symptoms or conditions listed in this table without even knowing that they're related. Incidentally, you can also get a better appreciation for the genetic component of neurotransmitter-based disorders when you look at this list. Many of our clients can trace back one or more of these dis disorders through their family tree. When you understand that many disorders can come from the same cause, it's easy to see that you can have a genetic predisposition towards neurotransmitter imbalance. Now I'm often asked, how can neurotransmitter imbalances cause so many different disorders? The answer lies in remembering that neurotransmitters are simply chemical messengers. If they don't func function properly, communication is impaired. This means that imbalances in neurotransmitters will cause a communication breakdown in the body which will lead to symptoms of some sort. Everyone is predisposed to certain states of disorder. For some it may be depression, for others it's anxiety or migraines, or any combination of, dis of the disorders listed above. No matter how the imbalance presents itself, these symptoms are your body's way of alerting you that something is not working right. Unfortunately, if and when a person seeks medical attention for these issues, they are often given medications that do nothing to, to correct the underlying problem and can often make it much worse. Many medications are used to try and manipulate the release or reuptake of neurotransmitters in the brain. Stimulants, including amphetamines, which um, cover methamphetamine, speed, Adderall, Vyvanse, and Dexedrine, as well as ecstasy, cocaine, methylphenidate, which is also known as Ritalin or Concerta, um, as well as norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, including Stratera and Edorox, and norepinephrine, re, excuse me, norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitors, including Welbutrin and Zyman, exert their effects by increasing the activity of norepinephrine and or dopamine in the brain by either blocking the reuptake or stimula stimulating the release of specific neurotransmitters. This can have the effect of increased neurotransmission over time, for a period of time, but it isn't a long-term solution, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Likewise, many anti-anxiety anti medications and sleep aids, including Ambien and Lunesta, 
In other depressants, such as alcohol and barbiturates, including phenobarbital and fioracet, as well as benzodiazepines, like Xanax, Clonopin, Valium, or Lorazepam, work in other neurotransmitters, such as gamma immunobutyric acid, also known as GABA, or glutamate or the catecholamines, which include dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, to try to exert their effects. Still, other medications work on serotonin, including selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which is a huge class of chemicals, which is one of the most widely used um, types of medication uh, in the United States and around the world. These include such things as Paxil, Prozac, Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro, and Luvox. What SSRIs do is they block the reuptake of serotonin back into what's called the presynaptic nerve, um, which means they trick the body into thinking there's more of the uh, neurotransmitter in the synapse than there actually is, and we're going to cover that in just a few seconds. Or you have other classes of chemicals called tryptans, which include Imitrex, Maxalt, Emerge, and Zomig. These are used for migraines, and what they do is they can temporarily dock with serotonin receptors and help alleviate the pain of migraine headaches. Again, the effects of these drugs seem similar to increased neurotransmitter within the brain for a period of time. However, that effect comes at a cost. I have this up here. It's not nice to fool with Mother Nature. It, it comes from a, uh, an old TV ad. I don't actually remember what it was for, but um, it, it serves its purpose. Is that it, is it, you can't fool the body for long. Uh, the problem with these medications, and many others from a neurotransmitter point of view, is that although they may have the effect that looks like increased neurotransmitter function, they don't actually help the body create more neurotransmitters. What they do is simply shuffle neurotransmitters around and attempt to make it appear that there is more neurotransmitter than, they actually, than there actually is, which is similar to the um, three-cup shuffle game that I have uh, shown up here. In essence, though, what these medications do is trick the body into thinking there's more neurotransmitter when, in fact, the medications are just moving neurotransmitters from one place to another. This can have at least two undesirable effects. The first is that it can increase uh, neurotransmitter depletion or imbalance. Our bodies like to be in balance. If something goes up, the body has many mechanisms to bring that something back down to achieve a steady state. This is often referred to as homeostasis. What happens when these medications uh, exert their effects is they trick the body into thinking there's more neurotransmitter than there actually is. The body naturally increases the degradation or destruction of these neurotransmitters because of that. Because these medications don't actually help the body make more neurotransmitter, this increased degradation will cause additional neurotransmitter depletion over time. This slide was taken off of a um, peer-reviewed paper that I have referenced down below. And it shows pretty well what's going on here. What's happening here is this is just showing a, a presynaptic neuron, and these are called presynaptic vesicles. This is neurotransmitter inside the vesicles here. So this is where the storage of neurotransmitter takes place. What happens when a um, when a signal gets sent down this neuron is it releases this neurotransmitter out into what's called the synapse here and then it travels across here and docks with one of these receptors. So these are the neurotransmitter and these are the neurotransmitter receptors. Right here is a reuptake, uh, a reuptake channel that brings it, the, the neurotransmitter back into presynaptic neuron once it's um, finished doing its job. What the drugs do is they block that reuptake so that less and less neurotransmitter can be taken back up into this presynaptic vesicle. Again, what it makes it look like is more neurotransmitter floating around in here. But again, as I said before, what the body will do when it sees more neurotransmitter in here is start breaking it down more. It releases more enzymes to break down these neurotransmitters. And what effectively happens over time is you have less and less neurotransmitter in these vesicles which means you have less and less neurotransmitter available to do the job over time, which causes depletion in the of neurotransmitter in the synapse. This is also what happens when medications such as antidepressants stop working. Uh, this often happens after months or years of use, but it can happen pretty quickly. Uh, medications that work on or with neurotransmitters stop working 
when the increased degradation of neurotransmitter caused by the drug has depleted a person's neurotransmitter reserves, which are these, the vesicles up here, to such a point that there's not enough neurotransmitter left for the drug to shuffle around. In essence, a person in this state is even more depleted than when they started the medication and often experiences not only a worsening of their original symptoms, but several other symptoms related to neurotransmitter imbalance as well. Unfortunately, at this point, a person is usually prescribed more of a given medication or additional medications to try and help them feel better. So again, after they've taken the drug, they're in a more depleted state than when they originally started. And really the only thing a medical doctor can do at that point is give them more of the drug or give them other drugs in addition to that drug. However, this only makes the underlying problem worse and it continues a downward sp spiral of ill health. The second undesirable effect um, of neurotransmitter-based medications has to do with actual drug-induced damage to the postsynaptic neuron and or its receptors. So the postsynaptic neuron receives information and the receptor is what catches the neurotransmitter to get to that information. Recall this slide back here. This is the postsynaptic neuron and this is the receptor that, that grabs onto the neurotransmitter. So you can also think of this, um, use an analogy of throwing a baseball. So if you're throwing a baseball to someone, the baseball here represents the neurotransmitter itself. It's, it's the information that's being relayed. The person you're throwing the baseball to, this little guy here in this picture, is the postsynaptic neuron. That's where the information is going. And the person throwing the baseball, the guy that has his back to us here, um, excuse me, is the presynaptic neuron. It's the one that releases it. The baseball glove is the receptor itself. That's what catches the information. So the presynaptic neuron releases the neurotransmitter. It goes across the synapse here. It docks with the receptor. And then the information is carried on. So if everything works well, you throw them the baseball, they catch it in their glove, and they can throw it to somebody else. This is basically how information is transmitted through neurotransmitters. However, many medications can cause damage to the postsynaptic neuron and or its neurotransmitter receptors. In our analogy, the drugs would make the person unable to catch the ball in some manner, either by harming the person directly, such as breaking their arm, or by damaging their glove to some degree where it can no longer grab onto the ball. Now what happens if you throw them the ball is they either can't catch it or they can't uh, throw it to anybody else and communication in essence stops. Now, this is very bad news from a neurotransmitter standpoint as it, as it disrupts normal communication which results in increased symptoms of imbalance over time. Furthermore, the damage to the postsynaptic neuron and or its receptor may be permanent. This is called neurotoxicity. This means that the receptor is damaged forever. When this happens, people often feel worse and or develop additional symptoms of neurotransmitter imbalance. Now again, this happens because the drugs didn't address the cause of imbalance and they ended up making the underlying problem worse. In our analogy, the baseball glove in essence becomes unusable. When they re but when people that have this condition then report it to their doctors, they're again often given higher doses of medication or additional medications which again make the underlying problem worse. So we need to do something that's going to actually address the true cause of the problem. And since the, since the cause of all these disorders are the disorders listed in the table at the beginning of this presentation is impaired or improper neurotransmitter function, what we need to do in order to eliminate these symptoms is we have to restore proper neurotransmitter function. This can be done by giving the body the nutrients it needs to make the necessary neurotransmitters and or overcome existing neurotoxicity. Since amino acids are the building blocks from which neurotransmitters are made, the process of determining the specific combination of nutrients needed by each person is often referred to as amino acid therapy. Now specialized training is required to effectively use amino acid therapy in clinical practice because everyone's needs are different. That means that they're going to require very specific, customized combinations of amino acids and other nutrients 
to help restore proper neurotransmitter function for their particular case. However, once a person receives the combination they need, all of the symptoms related to neurotransmitter imbalance will disappear. Now for some people this can take days or weeks, others it can take months, in a very few people it can take years, but it will work. That's the, that is, that's the kind of the silver lining of this cloud, is that if you have one of those neurotransmitter balances, by taking the right amount of amino acids and cofactors that your body needs to restore proper function, you will eliminate those symptoms. With over 600 clinics across the United States currently using this therapy, there may be a clinician in your area that you can seek out. If not, several clinics also conduct phone consultations to assist clients who are not otherwise, excuse me, who cannot otherwise get the care they need. But if you want some more information first, go to this website. It's aminoacidtherapy.com with dashes between amino acid therapy. Um, it, you can also help find a practitioner near, near you at this site. So this site contains a lot more information about, the, about neurotransmitter imbalances, including the causes of neurotransmitter imbalance, and it outlines a plan that you can use to address them. For those of you that are more scientifically inclined or that like to know the who's and why's of what makes this all work, that information is not, can be found on the site too, along with all the research that's been done up to date. If you or someone you love suffers from one or more of the disorders mentioned in this presentation, Amino, amino acid therapy can dramatically improve your life. So that about wraps up this presentation. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this short presentation on neurotransmitters and amino acid therapy. And be sure and leave a comment below or click on the like button if you found this information particularly useful. Best of luck to you and be sure to check out our other videos and presentations for more information.